voices. He just like if none of us were singing, it would still sound full in here. You know, some some people wonder uh, why Dave's so talented, so yeah. accomplished. Is what is he doing here? You know? <laughs> <laughs> some people wonder that. But, uh, no, it's actually funny because Dave. Uh, he was at another church, and the pastor got up one, one Sunday was preaching, and he was preaching on uh, uh, like addictions and and maybe sure we control ourselves. And he said, "If it was up to me, I'd take all the alcohol and, I, and all the beer and I throw it into the river." And then he goes, "If it was up to me, I'd take all the whiskey and all the wine and I throw it into the, the river. I, I, I'd take all the, the drugs. I'd take all the uh, all the cocaine, all the all the opioids, and I throw it into the river." And then, Closed in prayer and sat down, and Dave got up and said, Now let's now turn to hymn number 335, and let's close with, We shall meet down at the river. Let us gather at the river. Let us gather at the river. They didn't want to back after that. So, so we came down here. <laughs> that was because you made a joke about me a couple weeks ago. That was, that was, but now they don't care. He's going to come back every next week. And this is not going to end, is it? <laughs> but no, we're not going to talk about gathering at the river or addiction this morning. Here's, here's one that you will remember, though. <laughs> Some people went, oh, no, okay. But here's one you will remember, though. Um, uh, a rabbi, a priest, and a, a pastor were discussing, arguing about uh, how they were going to determine their incomes, how they were going to determine their salaries. And the priest goes, I have the perfect way. You go out to the parking lot, you draw a circle in the parking lot, you stand in the circle, you take that morning's offering, and then and you throw it into the air. And whatever lands inside the circle goes to God. Whatever lands outside the circle, Walt's heard this theory before, you know, whatever lands outside the circle, you get to keep. And the pastor, and the priest picks it off, and then the pastor goes, I, I agree with the approach, but uh, I, I disagree. I think whatever you throw in the air, whatever lands into the circle is yours, whatever lands outside the circle should be God's. And they're like, oh, that's very, that's very righteous of you. That's very, and, the, and the rabbi goes, no, no, you guys got it all wrong. You go outside with the offering, you throw it in the air. Whatever God wants, you'll keep. <laughs> this morning as we look at Romans chapter 4 we're going to start on Romans chapter 4 and we're going to discuss the things that are earned or the things that are owed uh, the wages so we're not going to go into the wages of sin just yet uh, we'll get there in chapter 6 but uh, right now we're going to talk about uh, these specific things of what we've earned but uh, before we get into it let's um, let's go in prayer and it says God bless our time Heavenly Father we thank you for your word Lord, we thank you for the ways you bless, the ways you take care of us, the ways you draw us into your presence. And Lord, we pray that you touch our hearts now. Speak to us, ready us for your word, your holy scripture, Lord. And the things that you have in store for us, the things that you have for us to learn. Prepare our hearts, ready. Speak through me now. Not my words, not my opinions, not my preferences, but what you have for us to hear. Speak to us internally, Lord, we thank you. So draw us into your presence. Speak to our hearts, ready me for your word. Speak through me now, we thank you. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So, uh, <laughs> excuse me, I didn't realize I was coughing, Joe, so you pointed that out to me. I, I am still coughing. You're a month later. It's so crazy. But, uh, but um, uh, about two weeks ago, we discussed how uh, Abraham believed in God 430 years before the law. Abraham believed, and that belief, that just that was faith, uh, it was justified to him as righteousness. It was credited to him as righteousness. He, Abraham believed, and it was credited to him as righteousness. And then last week we talked about how, uh, out, apart from the law, the verse was, apart from the law, the righteousness of God will be manifested to those who believe, uh, to those who uh, have faith in Jesus Christ. So justification through faith, the, man, the, just, the righteousness of God will be manifested in us. And it was made known to us, witnessed by the law of the prophets. That's what we talked about last week. Then this week we're picking up, and uh, Paul begins giving uh, examples of how this righteousness, this justification through faith, was manifested, was made witness through the law and the prophets. And he gives two examples, starting in chapter 4, about that starts off with Abraham. He gives two examples, Abraham and David. Both of these about the gospel in the Old Testament. We looked at this in Galatians, where we said Paul said it's a, 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 a foretaste of the gospel uh, when Abraham believed in God. And David's blessings, we see as a foretaste of the gospel. Well, the reason he starts off with Abraham, um, in my opinion, is because a lot of these, uh, um, uh, at this time, a lot of people looked at Abraham as the father of the faith. Even though we do now, even then, before uh, the, the, the New Testament was written, still people looked at Abraham as the father of the faith. The reason for that, and I think this is a thing that um, 
a lot of us in the uh, in the Protestant church, we forget sometimes. Uh, but, uh, like, <laughs> I think we forget that. Um, see, we, we, right here, we know this. We know this. But I think sometimes we, we uh, Josh, oh, he's giving me a cough shot. It's so sweet. <laughs> I almost not have to take it. Um, we have 66 books here in this Bible. And we consider this the holy scriptures of God. God, uh, the, 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 these books, these letters, these writings, these teachings, these history books, these prophecies were divinely inspired by the Holy Spirit of God. We believe God spoke these words to people and, and, and these individuals wrote them down and this is the divinely inspired words of God. After the Malachi wrote in about 400 B.C., there was about 400 years of silence, about 450 years before um, uh, Paul and uh, Matthew started, the, the gospel started writing, Paul started writing his letters. About, there was the silence. In that time period, there were many, many writings. That's something we, 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 we consider these to be, because these are the only ones that are important to us, these are the only ones that are divinely inspired. We forget, though, that there were many, many other writings. The Catholic Bible actually has seven books in the Old Testament that we don't have. Seven. Uh, and the reason I mention this is because a lot of these writings have, took place during this time. A lot of people, even the Gentiles at this time, believed these things. They took them to heart because some of these were good writings. They were good teachings. Uh, they might not have been divinely inspired, but they were truths. Uh, one of them being First Maccabees. We had the truth, the story of Hanukkah in there. My dad always makes the joke that um, the Catholics keep the history, the Jews keep the holiday. You know, but <laughs> in the First Maccabees, it, it, but, but what's also in First Maccabees, First Maccabees has a passage in it. Uh, that references Abraham's uh, works, reference Abraham's deeds. The first Maccabees references Abraham's actions as the reason he was justified as righteous. So a lot of people who were in this time, this is why, also why the Catholic believe on this doctrine of uh, works, because their Bible says it. And Abraham, you know, so, but Abraham, so a lot of these people believed Abraham as their father of faith. But then he also believed that he was credited as righteous because of, uh, or credited, he, was, he earned his righteousness because of works. And, and uh, also uh, in the Wisdom of Sirach, which is another book in the Catholic Bible, it says it's a similar thing. Uh, the, there's a number of passages also, um, in, in the Talmud says something in the Book of Jubilees. There are a number of writings that talk about Abraham uh, being uh, considered righteous because of his actions, because of his deeds. Because of his works. So that's why Paul starts off here and says, What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather according to the flesh, uh, our forefather according to uh, uh, our, our nationality, our forefather according to our ourselves, our flesh, not our faith. Because Abraham's our forefather according to the faith, but they're looking at works, not faith. And here it says, so our Abraham, What should we say? Abraham, our forefather according to the flesh, has found. For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about but not before God. And then it says, for what does the scripture say? Abraham believed in God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now, pull the next passage. The next verses give us this good insight in, into what this thing we're saying here. Uh, Abraham believed in God. And this passage, we all know, we all have heard this, but now to the one who works, his wage is not credited as favor, but as what is due. Makes perfect. Let, 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 let me tell you a quick story. I, I, when I was 16 years old, 1996, uh, my friend's dad had a plumbing supply business, and uh, he, they wanted to expand it, and the basement of it was just filled with plumbing supplies. And I mean, the basement was about as big, actually twice the size of this room, and from wall to wall, floor to ceiling, it was just old plumbing supplies, like toilets and sinks and pipes and drains and all this stuff, and he said, I'll give you a uh, day's wage to clean it out, and, and each day that it takes you, it takes you two or three days, you two clean it out, and we'll pay you for it. I was like, yeah, sure, I don't want to there. And he said, come 7 o'clock next morning, show 7 a.m. I worked hard. Man, I busted it. We, we worked from 7 to, uh, you know, we took a break for lunch, but then we went to about 4 or 5 a.m. So 8, 10 hours of work in my butt, and we, we cleared out about 40% of the room, and then we go upstairs, and he goes, here, he gave us 100 bucks. Now, in 1996, the day's wage was like 60, 80 bucks. So I was excited. I was like, all right, 100 dollars. But I, look, I earned that 100 dollars. I worked for it. The next day, I went there expecting 100 dollars, so I worked even harder. I lost it my butt, and we fit, practically finished the job. We almost got all of it done, and he gave us another 100 dollars. And I was excited. We went home on Wednesday. We come in and finish it up, and show up at 7 o'clock in the morning. And he goes, Hey, after you left yesterday, we went downstairs, we cleaned it out. And this morning, when we got in here, we finished up the job. No more work for you to do. You can go home. I was like, okay. He goes, hey, tell you what, because you came in, here's a hundred dollars. Wow. Missed me. Wow. <laughs> and he goes, he goes, here's a hundred dollars. Me and my buddy Tom were like, yeah, we were excited. I, I, I was excited. 
Look, on Monday, I earned that money. I worked for it, I earned it that money. On Tuesday, he owed it to me. At the end of the day, he owed me. He was indebted to me on one hundred dollars at the end of Tuesday. On Wednesday, it was a gift. On Wednesday, it was un deserved credit, undeserved reward. It was grace. It was nothing but grace. And if you look at that, it's the beautiful example of Jesus Christ and, and, and justification of lives. We can't earn it. If we could earn it, we would have to be perfect. We would have to work for it, earn it. And, and, but, but here's the thing. He, it was given to us. And it says, to the one who, but to the one who does not work, who believes in the one who justifies ungodly, faith is credited as righteousness. See, God decides. It's all on him. It's his choice, his decision, and he credits us. He doesn't give anything we did, not because of works, and he credits us with this righteousness. But here's the thing, on the flip side of that, when I went in there on Tuesday, after I finished Tuesday, I went upstairs, he owed me that hundred dollars. He owed me something, 60, 80 bucks. If we can earn favor with God, then it means God can be indebted to us. <laughs> think about that. If you can earn any kind of favor, it means God owes you Oh, that's a great person to owe you. <laughs> like, think about the, the creator of all owing oh, Josh Treesman. <laughs> yeah, I got God on my back. Huh? I mean, no, that's, that's not how it works. God does not owe us anything. And this is the, the thing that we think. Now, we know that we can't earn our salvation. We each, we know this deep down inside. We know we can't work for it. But I think somewhere deep down inside, we think that we are earning some sort of favor. We think that if we work and we serve and we minister and we do good things, that rewards will come. And look, we have rewards in heaven. And we know we're talking about these rewards, we're talking about these crowns. But I think somewhere deep down inside, we think that doing good is going to earn us some sort of existential sat uh, satisfaction. Here on this earth, we think that by doing good, that God should give us blessings, that God should give us joy and peace, that God should give us all kinds of rewards because I did good. And that's not how it works. God does not owe you anything. And we have to understand that. We have to remind ourselves of that. And that, that, that we serve and we work and because he's our master. Like, like Joe talked about last week, we're free slaves. We willingly give up ourselves for him. We willingly serve. We willingly sacrifice. And, but it's not because we're, and if you're doing it to try to earn some sort of favor, understand that's not how it works. Mm -hmm. Your, your, your uh, look, sufferings, trials, they are guaranteed. They're guaranteed. Your joy, your peace, your happiness is your responsibility. You can't work and earn. You have to, you, you, if God provides it for us, yes, because of our faithfulness. In, the, in Hebrews 6, I, I don't know how to give you this passage. Hebrews uh, uh, 11, 6. Hebrews 11, 6. You guys know the passage of Hebrews 11, 6? Anyone? Without faith, it is impossible to please God. But then the, the next verse, and, that, uh, and without faith, it is impossible to be awesome. Yeah. Please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is the rewarder of those who seek him. That you must believe. See, it's about our belief. It's about our faith. It's not about our actions that he rewards. It's our belief. It's our desire for him that we seek him and we chase him. It's not the actions that we do. It's not the rule. See, I think sometimes we think that if we work our way into blessings, we can work our way into satisfaction and happiness. And we can work. And God, God owes us happiness because I came to church this morning. And that's not how it works. That God does not owe you anything. And I'm not gonna go, I could go into much more detail about this, but we're not we're gonna stop here about it. But here's one thing I, I want to say. In Luke chapter 17, there's a parable Jesus talks about about a servant. Let's see how many of you are turning there right now. Okay, good. Okay, so often I say, but well, in this past, don't turn it now. Okay, turn it there. Okay. But in Luke chapter 17, Jesus talks about a parable of a servant. That's what we need to understand. We're the servant. We are, as Joe put it, free slaves. We, we are the servants. And, we, and how ridiculous is it of a servant to think that the master owes him anything? <laughs> and that's what we do. We think that we should be our thing. So we know we can't earn our salvation, but we do think that our works, you no, know, our works are out of sacrifice to our God because he is, because we're faithful to him. And, but it's not out of, we shouldn't be working because we think we're going to earn some sort of favor with him. Now to one who works, his weeks not credit favor, but is what is due. But to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly. And that's what it comes down to, that you believe in him who justifies the ungodly. And I think that's a challenge we face so often, because it goes on, faith is credit. I think the reason we don't, we don't believe in him who justifies the ungodly. Because now, go to the next verse. Because just as David also speaks of the blessings on the man whom God credits righteousness apart from works, he says, Blessed are those whose lawless deeds have been forgiven and whose sins have been covered. Blessed is the man whose sins the Lord does not take into account. This is 9, 10? We have 10 on there? Or is that just 8? 
the six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. Ten. Okay. No, no, ten. Uh, that ten or anyway, but that last part, we're just going to stop on the count and pick up the next part next week, next week. Uh, but uh, but uh, blesses, it blesses the man who the Lord does not take the sins into account. Blesses the man whose lawless deeds have been forgiven. And I think far too often we are um, we're missing out on these blessings. Far too often uh, because uh, because we're not believing in Him who justifies the ungodly, we miss out on His blessings. Look, blessed are those whose lawless deeds have been forgiven. We. I read Colossians, Colossians 1 20. In Colossians 1 20, it's a verse I use often uh, that we stand, I think it's 1 50, I'm not sure exactly where it is in Colossians 1, but we stand holy, blameless, and above reproach. I heard my dad pray often, thank God that we stand holy, blameless, and above reproach in God's eyes. You've heard me say this many times. But guys, we stand holy, blameless, and above reproach in the King and Creator's eyes because Christ paid the price for us. But for some reason, some of us, we still carry around guilt. Far too often, some of us, we still, whether it's guilt because we think that God, we don't believe in the one who justifies our God, we believe that God's still holding things against us, or because we're, we've done something wrong and we think they're holding against us, or because we've done people wrong, we've done God wrong, and we're still holding things against ourselves. We still carry around this guilt, and that's not a blessing. It says, blessed are those whose lawless deeds have been forgiven. Well, where's the blessing? If you're carrying around this guilt, that's not happiness. Uh, blessed are those who... So I think there's a challenge that we face uh, in there because we're not embracing this forgiveness. Because we're, we're, we're not believing in the one in verse... Like it said in verse 5, we're not believing in the one who... Uh, uh, we're not believing in the one who justifies the ungodly. We're not putting our faith in someone... And, and, and hit, uh, I'm not going to go too many details, not too many specifics, but here's what I, I, I want to share. Pull up uh, Psalm 32. This is the verse that Paul, uh, Paul is sharing here, Psalm, quoting David from Psalm 132. How blessed are those whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sin is covered. How blessed is the man whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, and in, whom, and in, who, in whose spirit there is no deceit. When I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. You got one more verse in there? No? Okay. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was drained as the way of the fever of heat or summer. Uh, I acknowledged my sin to you, and my iniquity I did not hide. So I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave my sin and my guilt. See, when he was hiding his iniquities, so look, if, if you have, if, if those times that you're still feeling this guilt, I will give you a couple uh, possibilities, a couple of reasons. One is that we're not confessing our sins. It's, look, David, he felt the weight of his sin. He, he still, look, he, he, um, go back to verse 3, if you want to again. In verse 3, he, I want to see the exact word he used. In the verse, it says, My body wasted away and groaning all day long because I hid my sins. This is the guilt we face. This is the pain we the shame we face. This is because far too often, we, look, we talk about justifying our sins. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about hiding it. Look, there's sins in our lives, and if we're honest, each one of us has things that we don't even want to admit to ourselves. We don't want to confess them to God because we're ashamed that we design that we even do them to our own selves. We, we think if we admit them and confess them, it makes us this horrible, more bad person. So we don't even acknowledge them. We hide them, we push them down, we suppress them, and we're not even acknowledging them to ourselves, but these sins are there. These sins are eating at us, and these sins are creating guilt within us. And, and they're wasting away our body. Look, sometimes we get sick and we get weak because we're holding on to sin. And sometimes we're groaning and we get depressed and we get bad, bitter and anxious and, and create this discontent and this discontent because we're holding on to sin. But when he, he confessed it, he was forgiven. It's a beautiful thing. It's the, it's the, it, it, it's the principle we've seen in 1 John. Many of you have heard it many times. For if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive. But far too often, we're carrying around this guilt. We're carrying around this debt. We're carrying around this discontent uh, because we're unwilling to admit these sins. God only knows it. He knows our sins. You know it. Deep down inside, you know it. Which I'm willing to confess. Just admit it because we want to hide them. Because we think that, uh, look, <laughs> if they're there, you are who you are. But if we think by not admitting them to ourselves, we're not that bad. <laughs> No, look, God knows who you are. You know what you've done. You confess and you release. And, and look, he said, Jesus said that you, now you know the truth and the, you are my disciples and you know the truth and the truth shall set you free. Amen. Far too willing, unwilling, too far too often, unwilling to acknowledge this truth. Within Another reason we, we carry around this guilt and we don't have these blessings that come from it is because we don't forgive one another. 
Jesus, in Matthew chapter 6, I gave you this passage, I remember that. Jesus said in chapter 6, if you forgive others for their transgressions, you, your heavenly Father, will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. Jesus, God will not forgive us. God, oh, God will not forgive us. Well, here's how this works. Someone does us wrong. Anyone been there? <laughs> Someone does us wrong. Look, and we, we have this bitterness towards them. We have this, this, this grudge we hold towards them. We have this contempt that we hold towards them. Because they did us wrong. But that contempt, that bitterness, that grudge, the grudge turns, in, uh, it turns into this, this discontent. It turns into this anger towards them. It turns into, uh, and we hold this grudge against them. We hold these hard feelings against them. And by what we're doing by holding these hard feelings against them, what we're doing is we're putting the offense above forgiveness. We're putting the offense over love. We're making the offense more important, more powerful than compassion. We're making this offense more important than God's word. We're making the offense more important than forgiveness. And what you're telling yourself is the offense is over forgiveness. And what you know, and now that you know the offense is over forgiveness, but you also know that you've sinned against others. You know deep down inside you've done wrong against other people, and you know you've sinned against God more important. So you have sinned against others, you sinned against God, and you know deep down inside you put offense above forgiveness. So you know there's no way anyone could or anyone should ever forgive you until you forgive others. If you're holding a grudge, you're going to hold on to this guilt. If you're holding on to contempt, you're going to hold on to this contempt. And if the grudge causes the guilt, the contempt, but you let go of it, you confess your sins, you forgive other people. You forgive them, and your Heavenly Father will forgive you. And it's a beautiful thing, but we hold on to this grudge, and it creates this guilt. And we're, because other people have done us wrong. Forgive them, and you shall be forgiven. <laughs> you know, listen, I'm going to point this out. I'm not, I'm not trying to look at anyone. Some of you make it very obvious you're holding your grudge against someone. <laughs> I, I didn't want to look at anyone. I didn't want to look at anyone. But some of you, your body language is saying that you're holding your grudge right now. All right? So you need, you need to forgive whoever it is. <laughs> I'm trying to put the people in the eye with it. All right. <laughs> and the last, the last reason, I, well, no, no, there's plenty of reasons. The last one I have time for this morning <laughs> is, is, I think, the reason we don't feel we don't feel forgiven, the reason we still carry around this guilt, the reason we don't have these blessings, uh, the blessings of, the blessing is the one whose sins have been forgiven, whose transgressions are not held against them, is because we're trying to do it ourselves. We're trying to do it ourselves. Now, we know that we can't earn our salvation. We understand this. But we still try to build ourselves up. We still try to promote ourselves. We still accomplish things through our own works and through our own gifts and through our abilities. And we still want people to like us. And we want people, and we look, so we're trying to earn some sort of favor ourselves. But ladies and gentlemen, you have to realize that there's nothing we can ever do to earn God's favor. We can't earn God's blessings. We can't earn God's salvation. That we stand holy, blameless, and above approach in God's eyes because of him, not because of us. And that's something we have to remind ourselves that it's nothing that we can do. Uh, it's bad. I'll, I'll, I'll start telling this close on my story. Um, <laughs> during uh, Alexander the Great's reign, his, uh, some of the people didn't like how he continued to expand his empire. Uh, some of the people in Macedonia wanted them, him to put more efforts. He was kind to his people, he was benevolent to his people, but he spent so much of his time on the road, you know? And, and people wanted him to spend more time tending to the people of Macedonia. So they started rebelling. Some of those people tried to rebel against him, and they, tried, uh, they were trying to tear him, take him down. And uh, Alexander said to one of his advisors, I'm going to put down this rebellion and put to death every last rebel. I'm going to put down this rebellion and put the death of the last rebel. And the time went by, and these rebels realized that Alexander was good for the nation, good for the country. They realized that they weren't going to overthrow this incredible general, this incredible leader. There was nothing they could do. So they went to him, they handed over their arms, and they, they submitted. They said, uh, King, we, we, are, we, we are Paula, forgive us. We've rebelled, we've done you wrong, and, and please have mercy upon us. Alexander looked at them, and he said, you obviously showed that you have abilities that people followed. So he promoted them to uh, positions of officers in his kingdom. These are rebels. And his, office, his, his advisor went to him and said, your highness, you said that you were going to put down the rebellion and put to death every last rebel. He said, I did. I, I, I have said that. And I have. And I will. But I see no rebels before me. I only see loyal subjects. 
See, Alexander the king decided that they were clean. He decided that they were forgiven. If the king decides you're forgiven, you're forgiven. And see, we might, uh, because of sin in our own heart, because of our discontent, because of our own wants, our own desires, our own thoughts, our own abilities, we think that we can earn salvation. We think that we can do something we can do ourselves. But ladies and gentlemen, we, we're going to always feel as if we're carrying down this guilt if you're trying to earn it yourself. If you're not forgiving others, you're going to carry down this guilt. And if you help, don't confess your sins, you're going to carry down this guilt. But understand, if the king declares you clean, you're forgiven. Yeah. If the king declares you clean, you're clean. I should say like that. That's right. If the king declares you clean, you're clean. If the king declares you forgiven, you're forgiven. And blessed is the man whose sins, whose transgressions are not held against him. Blessed is the man whose sins have been forgiven. And we have been forgiven. There should be blessings upon that. If you're not having feelings these blessings, you're missing something. And it's probably one of these reasons. But blessed is the man whose sins have been forgiven. Let's close the prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you for your truth. Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness that you have paid the price that we can stand redeemed, holy, blameless, and above reproach in the perfect God's eyes. We thank you. We thank you for the price that you paid that we can be justified because we believe. So Lord, instill into us, uh, strengthen us, that our, your spirit within us, strengthen our belief, and Lord, continue to bless accordingly. Continue to bless us because of sins that have been forgiven. We thank you. Be with us as we go. Continue to remind us that we are your servants and you are our king. We thank you and pray in Jesus' name. In closing, let's uh, make this our prayer as we leave here this morning. Take my life and let it be and stand.